Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the curator of public programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. I'm so pleased that you have all joined us today for a global destination for art, Artishir Tabrizi, presented in partnership with Barhang Foundation. Artists from all over the world flock to work in Los Angeles, drawn by the energy of ingenuity and the space for experimental expression. This series offers opportunities to visit the workspaces of international artists creating in our city of angels. Today, we are joined by the Fowler's Director of Education and Interpretation, Amy Landau, for a virtual visit to the studio of and a conversation with Artishir Tabrizi whose colorful mixed media paintings and works on paper feature imagery and methods that reference the rich literary and visual traditions of Iran, a country he left behind in his childhood. Born in Tehran, Iran in 81, Ardashir immigrated to the US with his family in 86 during the Iran-Iraq war. At the age of four, they settled in LA where he continues to live and work as a multimedia artist. Since 2019, Ardashir has been working with Roberts Projects in Los Angeles, where he debuted his first solo exhibition, Masjid. He has also participated in a variety of group shows and art fairs, including Art Basel Miami, The Armory Show, and the Untitled Fair Miami. Although he did not attend art school, Ardashir began his studio practice over 20 years ago and continues to work on new bodies of work for upcoming projects. Amy Landau is Director of Education and Interpretation at the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Landau's exhibitions include Jerome and His Circle, Travel, Art, and Business in the Middle East, and Pearls on a String, Artist, Patron, and Poet at the Great Islamic Courts. Her publications focus on cultural interchange between Iran and Europe and the Armenian community of New Jilfa. Landau received her doctorate from the University of Oxford, Islamic Art and Archaeology in 2009. She's currently co-founder and director of Art, Religion, and Cities at Morgan State University and co-director of Engaging Lived Religion in the 21st Century Museum at the Fowler. Before we get going, a quick technical note. In order to see both of our guests during the visual presentation, once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click View Options and then click Side-by-Side -side Mode. If you have questions during this program, please submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All right, that's enough from me. Over to you, Amy and Ardashir. Hi. Hi. Hi, How Ardashir. are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Good. Uh, I wanted to thank you for joining us today. It's, um, it was a cloudy morning in Los Angeles, one of those rare days, and now the sun's coming out. And I also wanted to thank our audience members. You have a wonderful crowd here today um, and they've sent in questions. So I'm gonna be spicing our conversation with some audience questions. Um, and I just wanted to thank you. Um, your work has a special place in my heart. It was one of the first exhibitions I saw when I moved back to LA in 2019. So Masjid was the first exhibition I saw upon taking this job at the Fowler. Wow. And what really captivated me is just how the audience, how the attendees were excited by your works. And I think what was going on is that your artworks have this ability to, to hold the gaze and catalyze conversations. So I know today is gonna to be a fantastic conversation between us. Um, I wanted this interaction to be slightly different than the experience we have in the gallery and that we're on Zoom, we're gonna take advantage of that fact so we could look at some of your paintings in detail and some of the sources that you're riffing off of in your work. Um, so with that, let's start the PowerPoint and look at one of your, I think this is one of your most recent works from 2020, Sitting Courtier. That's correct, yes. Okay, great. Can we see that first slide? Okay, fantastic. So this was our poster image for the program. Um, so how, what is the scale of this one? Uh, the scale of this is, is roughly a little bit bigger than this one, uh, the one that's behind me. So um, yeah, so it's about, I'm gonna say about 50 by 50, something like that. Uh-huh, and the materials? So the borders that you see there are, I, I 
collect uh, either digitally or actually hard copies of, of Qurans. And that, that's, that's actually the border of the Quran. The uh -huh. Quran that I and um, basically uh, there is gouache paint. Uh, there are, um, it's also fabric, kind of like a pattern fabric that you see. There's these splices in between. So one splice kind of carries a gouache layer and the other, other one is kind of got the fabric layer with the gouache, gouache layer and graphite kind of mixed in. Okay, so there's gouache and there's textile. There's gouache, textile, yes, correct. Uh-huh, and it's on canvas? On canvas, and, and the reason for that is, is I, I, I oh, some years ago I started going away from oil and acrylic just because I was much more comfortable with these kind of water-based um, inks and uh, colors. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at the next slide, um, you kindly put together some of your inspiration for this image. Yeah. So can you talk us through that? Yeah, so the, the furthest, you know, up, upright uh, is pretty much like a family image. Uh, uh, it's my mother and father and some other family members. And uh, the, 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 low, the lower image is, is you know, the, the sitting courtier. I think it's from the Safivad uh, dynasty um, of this guy sitting in, in, in court. And basically what I did is I, I uh, mirrored the image. If you see in the front, it's, it's the same image mirrored. And that was just for visual purposes. And in the background is, is my family image. You know, it's that family photo that's kind of intertwined in, in, with the two of them. Mm -hmm. And what I find fascinating about this work is it depends on how you're accessing it. What is your experience? So for example, this is one of my favorite Safavid paintings <laughs> with uh, the seated courtier. It's from an album, um, from the, which is now in the St. Petersburg was just now in St. Petersburg. And so I could only see the courtier when I looked at this image. And I found it really hard to see the figures of your family, your mother and your father. They creep in on you, yes, yes. Yeah, and so when was that picture taken? That was in the 70s. Um, little, little side note, uh, is I did that intentionally. I was trying to kind of mix an abstraction and a figurative kind of, uh, uh, base and, and that's really what I was trying to do anyway. So I, I wanted it to be where it was hard to kind of, you had to sit with it to kind of get it. You know what I mean? Where it wasn't kind of at first glance, you understood it. it I wanted it to be something that kind of dripped into the psyche of whoever was looking at it. Um, and, and I did that purposefully. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see that you gravitate towards the figure. So although your works are, the figure is abstracted, you're very, it seems like you're very, you're very focused on the figure and figural representation. Yeah, I mean, that, that actually goes, that goes pretty long with me. I mean, I, I so we'll, we'll take a little side detour here, but I basically came to, to art um, in a kind of roundabout way. I, I, uh, I, I was in photo school. I went to photo school for about a year. Um, and I ended up dropping out. Um, I was never that great a photographer and I was just looking at other people and, and they were just, I just wasn't interested. And, and at that time I was kind of dealing with some kind of uh, anxiety issues and uh, things of that nature. And I ended up moving back home from college. And um, there was a period of about a year or two where I, I wasn't really leaving the house. Um, I was just dealing with some things and I, I didn't feel comfortable leaving the house to tell you the truth. So what I did is to kind of, you know, just to, past the time is I started drawing. And a lot of those early drawings there, and then, you know, they kind of went on to canvases that were actually, I was kind of drawing on canvas as well with an ink pen. Um, a lot of those early things, they were, um, they were, they had the figure in them. So it's like, that's kind of where it started. I think I'm just innately attractive to, attracted to it. Um, I don't know why, I, I haven't really gone deep into it. Um, I, but, you know, it's, it was there from the get-go. And, um, you know, I, I, but I like, even with those um, early works, they, they were, they tended to be very, um, you know, um, almost abstracted as well. So it wasn't like a strict figure, like you, it, you had to sit there a little bit longer to kind of, kind of see the figures and kind of like, you know, looking at a cloud, it kind of came to you as you looked at it more, you know? Yeah. And you extracted the figure from the 17th century Persian source. Yeah. And yet you weren't drawn, let's say, to the background, to that landscape that suggests illusionistic space. Instead, you create sort of this flat surface through the vertical bands and 
the decoration. Yes, uh, so I guess that would be a, there's a selfish reason for that. I, I, I specifically wanted to tell a story. Um, yeah. And the good thing about having something that, like this, where it's, you know, it is abstracted in, in some ways, you can tell a story and it won't kind of be bogged down in, in kind of a didactic way, you know what I mean? So I, so that after the 2019 show, I was looking to paint again. Um, I, I, and I remember it was uh, right before Christmas and then at Christmas time is kind of when the idea formed. Um, and I, I think I spoke to some people, I spoke to my uncle about it, I'm sure. Um, I do remember talking to him about it. And it was basically, I was, the way I, and I usually with my works is I usually kind of have a sentence or a paragraph that I, I begin with or an idea. And then that kind of is like the jumping off point to the body of work. And for me, it was like trying to highlight like a drop of water in, in the ocean of, uh, of, of history. And, and I know that sounds a little grand, but that's really where it started is I was trying to, you know, and at the same time, at the same time, right after the, um, uh, after the, the show at, at Robert's Projects, I was again dealing with some anxiety issues and I ended, ended up seeing, started seeing a therapist. And um, the therapist and I, all the conversations that we had and whatever I was dealing with at the time, it would always kind of lean back into kind of time, um, mortality, disintegration of the self, all of these things that everyone deals with. Um, but for me, for some reason it's pronounced and um, it pops up in certain points in my life. Um, and uh, that's when I, you know, when I started seeing the therapist, this kind of, this work kind of started forming even more where I was trying to place myself and I, I don't like doing self portraits. So I use my family as an extension of the self, place myself in history in a space of time. And that's why you see these two kind of, um, overlapping things, you know what I mean? Almost like two frames of a film um, playing at the same time um, and kind of taking this linear history and making it cyclical. Um, and that's really what the purpose of that was. As, uh, so that's why, so I didn't even pay attention to the background. It wasn't of interest to me. Um, it was really the, the, the narrative of this figure sitting at that point in history and the narrative of my family sitting in, in their point in history and kind of finding a lineage between the two and trying to kind of bring all this into a visual space. Um, and uh, that's what, you know, that's what I did. And, and therefore both images are foregrounded, so to speak. Basically, yeah, they're keep. kind of mashed in together, basically, yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. So I would just want to turn to um, a slightly earlier work in a different medium. So if we could go forward one slide. Yeah, this is, the installation at Robert's Projects um, from that show, the 2019 show, Masjid. And I had such a good time <laughs> in front of this wall, I have to say. And the experience being in front of this wall where you're referencing so much of Persian history, pre-Islamic, Islamic, and it became this wonderful interaction with your images in which you're citing the source, so to speak. So here we have um, a fairy in front of us. We see your embroidered work and then the source, the painted source you were looking at. And the conversations were infused with references to the past if you had access to that past. And then you could share some of that information with whoever you were standing next to. So before we go into your sources a little bit more, um, tell us about your inspiration and the materials for this, for this okay. series. So this body of work, um, so this, the material specifically, so they're pages from the Quran basically. Um, and this kind of extended from an earlier body of work I was doing when I was younger in my twenties. And it was, I was taking pages from the Quran and I was painting on them, which you shouldn't do anyways, but I was doing it anyways. And I was my rebellious, it was a kind of a rebellious place uh, in my life. And, and I was, that's what I was doing with the work. Um, for this show though, it was, I had a little bit more time to think about it. Um, uh, some time to uh, kind of look into what, what I was pulling from. And what I was trying to do with this is to create a background. So the background is, is, is the Quran. And on top of it is this, painted black and I'm kind of trying to merge again um, multiple histories and 
starting from the foundation of Islam and kind of create these kinds of different narratives that existed at the same time or, or through time or different places um, and, and kind of merge them into a single plane. And that's really what I was doing with that. Um, and, and, you know, I, I no longer do those. I stopped doing a painting on the Quran and I just, now I just extended in using the border, but that body of work was specific for that, was to kind of tell this, um, this see, and I've always been attracted of telling multiple histories at once. Um, for some reason, as you can tell, my entire practice is that. Um, and that's what this was. And, and what be better kind of item than the Quran? Because it, it tells so much, it, you know, it kind of connects to so much of, of, of history of the Middle East and history of the world. Mm -hmm. And so we had a question that came in about your use of stitching. Correct. In these works, your embroidery. So what navigated your choice to embroider these works? It's visual, really. Um, it was a visual. It, it needed something. The, the, you know, the graphite and the black, it, it, it created a kind of muddy kind of composition. And I had, you know, I'd worked on this for a long time because I was doing on the doing these same things in my 20s. And I needed a kind of something to kind of make it jump off of the plane a little bit. And that, well, the embroidered work, the embroidery that you see on there, that is also what I have in my, uh, you know, in my paintings in the larger works, you know, I, I kind of use hand embroidery in there as well. And it kind of stemmed from these videos that, are, that I was watching um, in 2018 or something like this of, of this, you know, Suzanne Cotty, which is like a, you know, needlework in Iran. And I, I was watching these Persian ladies do it and I was just so interested. And I was kind of basically stole it. And, and I, I kind of incorporated it in this work. And, you know, oftentimes with artists, it's, it's all, there's, there's no real like, you know, game plan. You know, you go into the studio, you don't even want to have a game plan. You kind of want to have a base and you just want to kind of figure it out and kind of create something in the studio in the moment. And that's where the most interesting work comes from. And that's kind of where this was. It's just, it needed something intuitively. I looked at it and there it was, and, and I just put it in. And what's, your process for looking for these sources. And then, yeah, I, is it looking through photo albums, books you have at home? Um, all of it. All of it. All of it, but it's also a conversation that I have. I have this th thing, and, and I think it's just because I've been in the studio so long, you know what I mean? I've been doing this for so many years, is that sometimes these things just kind of pop in my head like I'll, I'll get like a visual of kind of what I'm looking for in my head. And then I have to kind of scavenger hunt to get that into a form that I can create. So a lot of these things were that, and they're, they're kind of intuitive. They're very quick. Um, and I try to keep it that way. I don't like, you know, overthinking things because yes, if you're a historian or whatnot, you'd ask what you should be doing. But as an artist, I, I don't think that's wise. I think you should keep it light and kind of be light on your feet. Um, so that there is room for the, the accident, there's room for you to kind of uh, figure things out, you know what I mean, in the moment. So it starts with an idea in your head rather than... Sometimes, it, it goes, it, sometimes it's, it's some, maybe I'm watching something and I'll see it, you know what I mean, I'm watching a documentary and it kind of, you know, int intrigues me to do something. So it really depends, it comes from multiple places. Um, I, I try to keep it loose as to where it comes from as long as it's, it's something that and I don't even know how to say this, but there's sometimes when you're working um, in the studio or when you're having these ideas, um, there's a feeling you get. And sometimes the feeling is a false feeling that like you, you want, you're attracted to something and you'll create it. And it's probably not a good idea to do it, but there's sometimes you, I don't know how to say it, but there's this feeling that you get that's actually feels right. And it's like this, I kind of honed that down to where it feels right to, I kind of know what I want to go after. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's become a little bit more point, you know, pointed in, in, in certain directions. Whenever I see it, I, I know I'm, I'm going in the right way. Um, and I've gotten better with this with the age anyways. Yeah, so if we go to the next slide, it's from the same body of works, and this is Darius. And it brings up this issue of intervisuality, you know, that an image is, an image meaning is not contained within its own frame that it's in conversation with a lineage of images across time and across place. 
and also across media, which your work shows so well. So while you, you said you were referencing this, um, it looks like an image from a book of the Persepolis reliefs. Yes. Yeah. And that painting or that book illustration itself is referencing other sources going Our back to relief. the relief. Yeah. So do you see yourself sort of in that continuum as it were, sort of that your images speak to this lineage of Persian visuality? I mean, I haven't had much time to think about that. And also, um, I don't know how to answer that, but I, I can say this, that um, I'm pulling from certain sources and, 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 and the sources that I'm pulling from, I'm, I'm attracted to um, because of where I come from, the, you know, the region I come from. Um, and then I'm taking that and then filtering it through a kind of Western perspective. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm kind of creating a hybrid out of that. Now, what becomes of that hybrid and whatever languages that creates, it's, I, I don't think I, I should really even think about that too much just because it's complicated. You, you don't know how history, you know, it deals different hands to different people. So I don't really know how, how it'll play out, but I'm not even interested in doing that. I'm just interested in creating works at that moment. You know what I mean? Right. And so there's the artist's intentionality and then it could be what the, the viewer is doing. The viewer over time, over a long period of time, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. And we did get um, a question in uh, from Egypt this morning about your intended audience. Do you think about your intended audience when you're creating the work? And if you do, are you picturing an Iranian or Iranian American audience or? No, not at all. Um, I, I, like I said, I am pulling from those sources and you know, some of the other work, I, I mean, you said Egypt, but there's like symbols in some of these new works that are pulling, the references are from larger, you know what I mean? There are larger references that they're pulling from Egypt, they're pulling from uh, Israel, they're pulling from, you know, Islamic places, um, uh, countries. So I'm, for me, I, I, I'm not specifically trying to cater to an audience. Um, I, I, that's not really interesting to me. Um, mm -hmm. For me is, is to create I mean, we're not talking about Malcolm X, but create the best image possible by any means necessary, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I mean? So that's really, that's all the, that's all that really interests me. And how does the relationship of your identity as an Iranian American play in, in terms of leaving Iran at a young age, and now you're, you're interacting artistically with these images and there's, do you think there's something in that process in terms of yeah. defining your own identity? That I've, I've thought about actually some, um, and I, the feeling I get, and I could be wrong about this, but this is just really geared toward myself. The feeling I get is that when you leave a place at a certain age, you know, at an early age, you kind of become disconnected from it in a way it's almost kind of, it's not gently broken, it's kind of ripped. So when that happens, you, you get this longing of sorts. And it's not even a longing for the place, you know what I mean? It's a longing for some idealized version of this place. Um, and the imagery that I use, uh, yeah, I mean, most of this stuff I'm attracted to, I don't even know why I'm visually attracted. I've always been attracted to it. So when I, you know, when I was looking at Western art, I was attracted to artists like Matisse. And the reason being is that he would use pattern in such a brilliant way. And that really tied in with my, you know, sensibility as, a, as, as someone from the Middle East, you know what I mean? Um, so I've always been interested in, in, in certain things. I don't even know why, but I think it has something to do with this, this fact that I didn't spend that much time in that place, you know what I mean? So I'm looking at it from the outside and pulling things um, as a kind of discovery tool, you know? Yeah. So in a certain way, it's a, it's a meditative experience too. I suppose. It's a, rooting, it's a rooting experience. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. So we did get a question in from Los Angeles about the significance of the carefully embroidered lines of these colored threads. So it seems like in this one with Darius, you're emphasizing his power as a king or... Uh, again, you know, I, I would be careful of reading it as an artist. I, I, yeah. I don't get into it that way. Um, it's a yeah. visual thing. Maybe that's what I was doing subconsciously. I don't know. But that's not what was in my mind at the time. Um, for me, it was 
it needed something visually there. I needed it because it needed a point to, you know, kind of tie in the whole piece together. So I used the center and I'm using these embroidered threads, kind of pulling everything to the center of the piece itself. So for me, it was a visual thing. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And I noticed that a lot of reviewers um, gravitate towards your work in the multitude of media you draw upon, uh, particularly your textile pieces, which I want to move forward to the next slide. Yeah. So this is a recent piece, correct? Uh, yeah, this is from 2020, this year, yes. And can you speak a little bit about those sources? Yeah, so this I was reading, um, I know specifically because this body of work kind of kind of delved into a lot of other new things, but this was one of the first in the series and it was uh, before a trip uh, to India as well. And I'll talk to, about that in a second, but it was basically, I was reading this book by, uh, called The History of Iran, Michael Ax Axworthy, I think it is. Um, and it basically, you know, I, I grew up knowing a little bit about Iranian history, but I've, I've known, you know, I've learned more about it as I've gotten older, just from reading and, and watching things and whatnot. And basically the book was explaining, you know, Persian influence in that region, you know what I mean? Um, especially like their war with Babylon, you know what I mean? Or something like that. Like it was just talking about how Iran or the Persian, uh, uh, Persian Empire had its hands in a lot of places and vice versa, other places had their hands in, in, in Persian identity. So it was like this kind of, and again, it's like, I start from this place where I just kind of create this, this paragraph or this sentence or this idea. And I was like trying to like take this idea of having overlapping histories and instead of saying overlapping cultures and kind of extending it out and kind of creating this visual soup in a way of different visual um, uh, elements from different cultures um, to bring it under one roof and to see if it works visually. And that's kind of what I did with this. Um, and it came from that idea that, oh, you know, I, 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 there was an interaction between Babylon and there was an interaction between Persia. Simple as that. And I wanted to, you know, and I extended it to, there's some Zoroastrian symbols in there and, you know, the Zoroastrian re religion also spreads out throughout the Middle East starting from Persia. So it's kind of this idea of how one thing from one place can spread out into other regions and how uh, you know other things from other regions can can come and influence that you know starting point so it's it's kind of this again this taking these two things and overlapping them into one identity and i suppose that kind of ties into who i am as well taking two different things and making it into this one individual does that make sense yeah yeah so on the right we're looking at that's the lion of ishtar on the of babylon, yeah. Of babylon yeah which is now um the gates are in the in berlin um, and it's sort of like a recapturing too <laughs> of that image in certain ways, which is the central image. And then those half moons, are they? They're half roundels? Yeah, these, uh, these are pretty much half. They're, they're all embroidered. So that background is entirely embroidered and they're all half. Um, you know, I usually use circles or, or, or kind of a half crescent. Um, there's no real purpose for it, just visual again. And you have Qajar 19th looks like 19th century Shaws in those images. And the yeah, I think he's a statesman or in the background there. Um, and the funny thing about that embroidery back there, that was a very detailed embroidery. So that piece, just the background itself took me four months, three, four months. Right, so it's really labor intensive. You that have, this, yeah, you have this in the studio. So I wonder if we could look at it up close. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. great. So this is some other work which we'll talk about, but here it is. Yeah, yeah so we could go. Go closer. Yeah. And if you look kind of close here, do you see how you know that's that's really it was like multiple layers of color. Mm -hmm. And so for that one, are you looking at a photograph? For this image here? Yeah. This was a photograph, yeah. This was a photograph. Actually, that background, um, I, I, you know, this background I create in Photoshop. So this was uh, the photograph. I cut this out. This was actually a painting. I'm sorry. This was a kind of a portrait, and I basically cut this portrait out and 
put it on top of a stained glass from an uh, is, uh, multiple stained glass kind of overlapping each other from an um, from an Islamic mosque. So it just, and it was, again, it was a visual kind of thing. And I wanted to kind of create this very vibrant visual image. And that's kind of what this was. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that stained glass is so common, right? In Iran, in the early modern period for yes. religious and domestic architecture. And you're playing with that here. Yeah, and this, uh, this image I actually wanted to say is like, th so this is actually from a car and you know, it's me kind of taking the personal and embedding it into the work. I mean, this is a, um, from one of my grandmother's carpets. Um, I basically took one of the uh, images from there and had it kind of digitized to be embroidered. And so, it's, you know, there's that's some of that in there as well. Yeah, that's great. Here, we'll take and how look. long would one of these works take? I'm also looking at the questions that I'm being fed to. Uh, it depends. It really depends on the work itself. Like this one here particularly took a long time, you know what I mean? Just because of, you know, what I told you because of the background, but it depends. Like, I mean, I have one work here, let's say um, this one here took, you know, about a, a, a maybe about a month or so. Um, and, you know, the background, it's mostly the background that takes some time. And then, you know, there's the painting that comes with, you know, with that, that goes on top of it and, and whatnot. And, you know, I usually have someone assist me with the embroidery in the background. Um, and then, you know, I'll build on top of that. Yeah. Can we go back to the Lion of Eshtar? For Absolutely. A bit? Sure. And then we can move on to that one because um, we're getting some questions in. So if we take just a step back and look at the entire composition. Let me step back. Sure. So you seem to gravitate in creating a, com a composition to have a central image. Is that correct? I do. I've always been doing that. And um, I have some theories about it myself, but I don't know if they're actually, yeah, they're, it's, it's true or not. <laughs> it's your work, so it's got to be true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always you feel own like this. Is, <laughs> maybe I, I've always, well, I mean, because it's a little complicated. I, I feel like, the, because there is a lot of work that I've done, and it's always, I, I gravitate towards some kind of central image. Um, um, and I always feel like it's, it's kind of a self-portrait in a way. It's, it's like the portrait, you know what I mean, of, of me telling some kind of narrative about myself. Um, and that's kind of what I've come up with. Um, so you're identifying with the lion. Oh, I, I, that's, like I said, it's complicated. It doesn't have to be so yeah. specific. Um, it's just a general kind of thing. So um, someone's asking, did someone embroider the half moons for him and then he attaches them to the background? No, they're actually the, here, I'll show you if we go close. So this is actually canvas, if you look. It's embroidered directly onto the canvas. Yeah. So it depends. Yes, some of them are done. And it's like kind of a family affair. Like these, I, this one I did myself, um, the back the embroidery. I mean, this one here, like my aunt did. Um, I have another one over here that my mother did. So it's, it depends on, on what it is. But, you know, it, usually I, I have people. Oh, so your it. mother does it as well? My mother and my aunt. Yeah, both of them help. It's a family affair. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have, for this work, we also have a question asking you to say a little bit more about the framing and the positioning of the main subject in the Lion of Eshtar. Yeah, that's kind of an intuitive thing, I would say, but, you know, it kind of goes back to miniatures in a way, you know what I mean? Because if you look at the, it's, it, there's a border, you know what I mean? That kind of encapsulates what's inside of the, 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 the borders. And it's basically, that goes back to, you know, miniatures and that, you know, things that I've been looking at. Um, and I just kind of allow that to drip into the work. Mm, mm. So we also have another question about your original inspiration to use this particular medium of using embroidery and quilt work. Um, and then reflecting the strong cultural foundation in quilting in Iran. There is, and I, 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 I've, uh, again, had a little bit of time to think about that over, over time. And, I, and I've come up with this thing that it probably has something to do with growing up in a household that had a lot of this stuff in it. You know what I mean? Um, if you're, you know, Persian, usually that it's on the tables, on, on, on chairs, there's always, there's tapestries everywhere and there's, you know, carpets on the floor. Um, so I've always been attracted to that. And I, again, like I said, I go back to Matisse. I've always been attracted to that kind of patterning, that kind of visual um, play with pattern. Mm. And that gives us pause, 
right? Because you're citing Matisse for an overall inspiration for patterning, where if one were in conversation with you, one might assume that it's from the decorative approach to Persian miniatures or illumination. Yeah, it could be both. It could be both because I'm actually, you know, pulling from multiple. And the reason I say Matisse is because I'm actually really interested in him right now. I always have been, but I've been looking more into him um, as I've gotten older. But yeah, no, the, 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 the sources are, 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 you know, they vary. Mm -hmm. And I read that one reviewer was, I think, was commenting on this particular piece and in reference to the central image, and then the all over design was citing um, Persian carpets. He was citing that it looked like a Persian card. Is that what? Yeah, with a central design. That's yeah. Again, like like I said, it it, it pulls from a lot of those sources. So it, yes, it, it Persian carpets, Persian miniatures. Um, I've always been attracted to the border, kind of framing the image in the center. Um, I don't know why that is though. You know what I mean? I, I it's it's kind of an intuitive thing, and uh, I just go with it. Um, but yes, like these, like this one's a simpler border, but some of the other ones they have like you know they, the 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 border's a little bit more pronounced. Mm -hmm. So with this one, let's look at this one now, and mm -hmm. we could address a question that came in. What is your process for creating a color palette for each work? Again, I have to say intuitive. I, I do this like on the fly, like just as one color kind of, you, I'll put one color down and that color references the next color and so on and so forth. It's usually a step-by-step -step process, but I, I try to keep it very intuitive. Um, I try to keep it very on, 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 the, on the fly, but also, you know, there will be pieces that I will like, you know, let's say I'll, I'll paint a certain part of it and it looks great. And then I'll do something on the bottom. And then all of a sudden the top looks no good anymore. So then I'll have to kind of go from there and kind of recreate the top again. So it's really kind of a, a, an intuitive process. And usually these things are, you know, one thing, you know, uh, it leads to another. So it's basically the two of them have to work together or the three of them have to work together. So you just have to kind of play with it in the moment. Mm -hmm. So there's a few more questions coming in about process, but Let's just take an overall view of, of this? this work. Yeah. Sure. What are we looking at? So this is uh, from the Shah Nama. It's uh, Rostam, and uh, you know he's kind of fighting a serpent on his horse. Um, the imagery in the background, and this kind of goes back to my trip in, to India. This is actually an Indian image yeah. uh, from from an in Indian manuscript back here. Um, and I, that's just some interest that I had when I went to India. I just saw a lot of connections between, you know, the, the, their visual style and, you know, the, the, the Persian visual style. And I, I kind of wanted to, again, come back and, and mix the two together to create kind of this singular image. And, you know, it has kind of references of Islam here, this, you know, this crescent and star here. This, again, is from my one of my grandmother's carpets that I've, you know, kind of digitized one of the images there. Um, so it's kind of a, a thing of bringing everything that I'm, experiencing along with you know my history along with you know my you know where I grew up and, and all the things and just kind of bringing it under one roof of one piece. Yeah so I have a question does he trace from the original or use a digital device? And what are we talking about here are we talking about the overall image? I guess specific images. Yeah yeah those are uh, you have to I, I pretty much have to kind of create the drawing or you know trace it's the thing is I tweak it sometimes it, it's like it's not a straight trace um some of them are some of them aren't because they just don't work because I'm, I'm you know I'm hand embroidering them in so I'll have to simplify some things remove some things add some things and you know then I'll I'll have a tracing paper which I'll put and I'll hand embroider on top of that mm -hmm. um and then another question about sources have any of the numerous cultures of Africa ever influenced your work? I have not, no, not nothing, you know, I haven't looked, I'll be honest. Like, like for me, I'm, I'm just taking it from from sources that I get. And like, you know, I, I again, I, I told you I read that book and that's, you know, I, I pulled Babylon. Um, you know, there's some, some, I mean, there's something here on this work here, which I don't want to keep moving around, but this, this one here has something from Egypt, but you know, it depends really. Mm -hmm. It has to look, you know, it has to fit with the work itself as well, but nothing yet as of yet, no. Mm -hmm. And then a question about the patterning, the patterning that goes off the frame. Can you say a bit more of that, your relationship to the margins and an extension outside of them? 
I don't know what you mean by that. Do you mean? Oh, so right here, you're getting close up to the margin. And I think our visitor, yeah, talking about that. It looks like it's continuing. This, the, oh, this is continuing? Yeah, like the pattern's not framed. There's not an abrupt stop, but it looks like it's extending beyond the margin. Oh yeah, I mean, that's just a pra practical thing. Uh, you, you can't, it, it's very complicated to line it up perfectly um, because you're embroidering. Um, so it's it's just extended. So that's just a practical. There's no no real purpose for that. Yeah. So have you been back to Iran since the revolution? I have not. Mm -hmm. Family has though. A lot of family has. Um, so a lot of family has to tra travels back and forth still. But uh, I have not been back. So we have another question that came in. Um, and it's about the general composition, um, asking that it reminds this individual of a prayer rug. Is that intentional? No, I actually never, no. Um, th there's, maybe it might, but uh, no, there was no intention for that. No, I, I, I don't know. And so we also have, are there sources purely historical or are there <laughs> elements of the present day? Well, like I said, there there are historical, but yes, it's it's you know the stuff that I'll throw in there. Yeah, your, um, the carpet yes. in your home. Yeah, something that has something to do with me, especially like if you look at the paintings as well. A lot of those paintings, you know, I have family images. So I try to mix the two. I try to like kind of take history and kind of put myself in it. And I suppose that's a way of me dealing with death, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um and then we have another one. The questions are flowing in, not to share. <laughs> should I continue to do it this way or should we sit down and keep talking? Well, however you feel most comfortable. It I would be great to see. Go ahead. You want to take a seat and relax? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. This way you don't have to work so hard. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we're having some technical difficulty. I'm going to fix this here. All right, there we go. Cool. Yes, all right. Yeah, thank you for that tour. Yeah, no worries. So I'm glad people can see the, the, the surface of them, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's a real treat. Different than the um, PowerPoint images. So we have another question about process. Sure. And that, so when you start off, do you start off thinking about the particular medium you wish to work in? Or is that there's an idea first? Like what proceeds? Is it? Yeah, see, see, the thing is that, again, so this is just, and I think if you talk to any artist who, who you know, practices regularly in the studio, they probably say the same thing. You, you have basic ideas, you know what I mean? Like kind of an outline and it's a very general kind of thing, but you, and in my experience, you try to avoid kind of pinning it down. Um, you just kind of in the moment, create the work and see what comes of it. So yeah, the, the like when I first started, um, I, I was actually working on these uh, larger kind of tapestries with, where this, you know, this work came from. So I created this large tapestry and it had some embroidery in it, but it also had other things in it as well. And then what I noticed is that, hey, I was looking at that piece and I was like, wow, the embroidery alone is the most interesting thing about this entire piece. You know what I mean? So then what I did is I took that embroidery, repeated it multiple times. Then I had to actually kind of get past this mental place of, oh my God, this is going to take forever. I'm embroidering, you know, multiple times over this can. Then, I, you know, it, it was like, okay, then I create this canvas with embroidered pieces. And then what do I do? And it was just like a step-by-step -step process, you know what I mean? Of creating it, and those black lines um, that kind of tie it all together, yeah. you know, all vertical lines. Um, that was it's kind of weird if I said it sounds stupid, but I was literally in the studio like, oh, I need to tie this together. And I saw a, a one inch tape in my studio, like, you know, that you get from Home Depot. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. And I just started taping it and, and embroidering it. And the thing with me is that I'm not, you know, I don't, if, if something doesn't work, I'll throw it away. I'll destroy it. I just, you know, I've destroyed lots of work. So I can play with things. So I'm not, you know, I'm not tied into something. So it's like, okay, I'm going to try this and see if it works visually. 
you would, you know, you play with it, you'll sit on, sit with it, allow it, you know, sit for a week with it. And then if it ties it in, and I noticed that when I was doing those vertical lines, what it did is that it took everything from the outside of the image and it tied it into the center. And it kind of created a, a, a much richer experience for the viewer. You know what I mean? And, and that was, there was no, you know, I didn't write that down. That wasn't an intentional thing. It was kind of an intuitive thing that I fell into, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But once, once you see it, you know it's good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And is it true that even when you have this, I mean, that series on paper with the single image and the embroidery, you know, the black ground with the single image and white graphite, that's huge. I mean, visually, that just seems like such a success. But yet you stop that series, correct? That is correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting too. Yeah, I didn't, I, you know, I, I, again, I don't want the idea of rebelliousness against something to overtake the work. Mm -hmm. I want works to be just appreciated for what they are. You know what I mean? Like visually. And mm -hmm. I felt that with that work, because of what I was using, it kind of, it muddied it. And, and sometimes I like, even though it's good, you can produce a lot of work in this world. You know what I mean? I can't or whatever. But sometimes you have to let go of things and just move on to the next thing for multiple reasons. But yeah, it was also, I just visually, I was just no longer interested. I just didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But I did take something from there. I took the, those borders and I extended that into the new work. Um, so, right. you, you know, you take little pieces out and you move on, you move on, you know. And do you engage with specific collections of manuscripts? Like if there's a museum with a lot of Islamic manuscripts or Persian manuscripts and they've digitized them, for example. I'm equal opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll it. <laughs> I just, I just, I really just go down the rabbit hole sometimes. I, you know, I, I purchase a lot of books um, from online that come, you know, or back when the libraries were open, you can kind of go like, especially the one in Glendale, there's a beautiful library there that you can go in and look at things, but no longer. So now I, I, I get stuff online or, you know, I'll go look through collections or maybe things I see on Instagram. I follow some accounts that, you know, post something that I'm like, oh, that looks really interesting. And again, it's a visual thing. You look at it and you're like, wow, that looks super interesting. That, that could be the basis of an idea. And then, you know, you'll go after it and then you'll pull things from it. And sometimes it doesn't work. Um, I would say, you know, 50% of the times it doesn't work, you know, but sometimes when you hit it, that one idea could lead on to many other ideas. Mm. Do you keep an archive of images that inspire you? I say one, if it's no good, but best trash. I mean, there was a period, I think this was when I was in my th early thirties uh, for one year, I said, I'm going to just one or two years. It was like, I'm just going to work and destroy. And that's what I did. I think it was for, for, it ended up being like six, seven months. I, and I, almost a year and I, I started working and destroying, I think, yeah. And it was just everything I was working on, I just destroyed it. Just because there's something liberating about that, that you can say that, yes, I created, I spent all this time on this thing, but it's not that important to me. And it's important in the end, but it's only important if the visual, if it visually falls together. Yeah. Not for the sake of the object itself. Forget the object, it's meaningless. It's what's on it, it's what's it's trying to, tell or say visually. And if it doesn't say that, off with it said. And it also gets you to the next step too. It does. Yeah. So, yes. so I want to, let's come back to that because we really all want to know what your next steps are and what's your, what are your future projects. But I want to address some of these questions coming in. So someone's asking, do you work on more than one work at a time? Uh, depends on what mood I'm in. Um, oftentimes, I, I, I try to do one at a time, but if I'm, it depends on you know where I'm, I'm mentally. Sometimes I can work on multiple things at once. It just depends. Sometimes I'll do like parts of one piece early, you know, like together with while I'm doing a, another thing. But what I found out actually, I forgot about this. I was working on four things at once just recently, and I realized that I was getting anxiety attacks. So I gotta stop. So. Because it's also you have sewing machines going on at once. You have things going on here, so it's like focus is, is better. So it depends on what I'm working on, but right now I, I'm going to try to keep it one at a time. Yeah, focus. Um, something we're all lacking these days, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So we have another question. Are there high resolution images of your work available online? Well, I mean, they're on my website. They're loving the details and they would love to explore those details. There isn't, but maybe I should look into that. But yeah, they, they, I mean, if you go on my website, they're pretty high res, but but not super, you know, there's limits to what you can do there. Um, but you know, there's some, but yeah, I, that's something I, I should probably look into doing. So there's, you have artisheertabrizi.com. It's, it's a tabrizi-art.com. But if you just put artisheertabrizi art, yeah, it'll pop we'll up it. for a second, yeah. Yeah, we did actually have another a question that came in from Los Angeles about the desire to look at your work like in, a, in an online exhibition. Yeah, I actually am working with a, uh, someone and he, you know, I send him videos now for him to show clients or whatnot. And it's basically because the videos really show that this, like, you know, when we did the walk around, you get to see that surface because it's really important to it. And that's really, yeah, I mean, that was partly purposeful, I, I think, at this point, because I, at the time when I was starting this work, I was looking to kind of go beyond this Instagram look, you know what I mean, of having a work that looks good on Instagram, and then when you see it in person, sometimes it falls off. Um, it doesn't always happen, but, you know, sometimes it happens, and, and I didn't want that. I wanted something that looked okay on Instagram, or decent, pretty cool, but then when you saw it in person, you're like, God damn, that looks really good, and I was like, visually delicious, all the nice things, you know what I mean, and, and that's what I was looking for specifically. Yeah, so we also have a question, and this leads into the question about what's next for you. Um, are there any works for sale? And if so, where? Uh, you'd have to contact my gallery on that one, uh, yeah. Um, so what's next? What are the next projects? Well, there's a couple of things. I've, I'm working on some sculpture, I'm working on some video, I'm, I'm working oh, on a lot. Sculpture? Yeah, that's, that's the thing, but I'll never show it. There's a few people who've seen them, but I, I, I won't, because they're, they're very elementary. They're not there yet. So I'm working on, on some things, yeah. Um, I, I do want to extend a little bit further into the paintings. They're just so late. You know, I thought that the embroidery works were labor intensive, and they are, um, but I'm finding out that the paintings are as well. And actually, I'm going to go off on a little tangent. My entire life, I've been attracted to work that takes a long time to do. Like, I'm not attracted to something that is, is I've never been that, I don't know. And I like, I realized as I've gotten older, I'm just gonna stick with that. So yeah, maybe I'm, uh, you know, again, I'm working on these uh, videos right now and I'm working on some sculpture, but this is, these are side projects for me for now. If they're any good, then we'll show them at some point. Mm -hmm. So th that labor and also the repetition of your images too, and the power that your images get both the repetition of the detailed image in one composition and also your rep the repetition of your approach is very powerful. And I also am thinking about this theme of how it sort of calms you <laughs> and it's, it supplies comfort and joy just in the very practice. Um, so, you know, I think I touched on this earlier. It's like, I, you know, when I came to, when I came to the contemporary, I, when I came to the painting or whatever, you know, when I started doing this is, it was because I was trying to calm myself. I was trying to find some place to put my energy to, um, you know, I, I was home a lot and I needed a place to kind of, I was having a lot of anxiety and I was trying to put my energy somewhere. So I think that's where the practice started and it's, it's still true today, you know what I mean? Um, it, now it's become something else. I'm actually trying to say something visually. Originally, I wasn't, I was actually just delving into the subconscious and bringing the unknown into the known. And that's all I was doing. But now I'm, I'm finding out, you know, that that's still heavily in, in the practice. Hmm. So I just wanted to, to thank you. Um, artists like you who are bringing these different images and these beautiful stories too. We didn't go much into it today, but we'll definitely go into it next time. But just these wonderful stories from Iran about courage and patience and practice um, and friendship are, they may be from Iran, but they're really globally important. Um, and it's artists like you who really make LA a great place. So thanks I appreciate so that. I wanted to thank you for spending this time with us and spending time with our audiences. And we look forward to another conversation. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you. Yes, thank you both so much for such an interesting hour that just flew by.
Artish, your, your work is just so complex and so impressive. Thank you so much for sharing with us your process and the inspiration that you find. And Amy, thank you for teasing out all of those elements that we might otherwise have missed. Thank you to everyone who joined us as well. This program has been recorded. It will be available on our website and on our Instagram for you to revisit and share. And we hope that you'll join us again next time. Uh, details about our next program will be found on the closing slide. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Have a great day.